All right. What's up, guys? I am nobody special. It is that time again. Happy Friday, everybody. The end of the week is upon us. What a week it has been. Not really. It hasn't been that great of a week. But you know what? The good thing about lousy weeks is they're over. This week is over. And we have a theme for today. Today, when we talk about all these stories, you will notice the Wi-Fi password has changed. You reckon that's a security risk, putting that up there? But today's Wi-Fi password is no FOMO. All right? And let me preface everything by covering my butt and saying, I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Do your own research, your own DD. Arrive at a decision that's right for you based on your unique situation. Man, I'm getting good at saying that fast, aren't I? Got to get faster with it. But that being said, today is all about no FOMO. Okay? We are not going to chase, especially during market bubbles. No FOMO. Okay? That goes for stocks. That goes for Bitcoin. That goes for commodities. Whatever it is. No FOMO. Wait for the right time to buy. Do not chase. Do not be that guy who buys at the top. Do not be me buying a condo in 2006 and losing all the money you made shucking scallops in the North Atlantic. That may be a very specific example that doesn't apply to you directly, but you get where I'm going with this. All right. With that, let's is that time? Are we gonna say it? Are we gonna are we gonna say the melon thing today? What do you think? Should we give the melon a rest? I don't know. We'll see. We're gonna shrink. We'll we'll just shrink me for now. We'll give the melon a rest. Um, shout out to Corona Light No at Dilly Flip D on Twitter for this that absolutely made my day when I saw this on Twitter today, and I am still laughing on the inside. I assure you. And he says. Even with supply issues, no one wants this processed vegan sludge will be left on the sh shelf through an apocalypse. And if you can't tell what we're looking at here, folks, this is the story that we are all familiar with, the empty shelves at the supermarket. But you notice nobody has touched the Beyond Burgers. Nobody wants to eat that processed tofu crap. Nobody wants your commie meat. Nobody wants your quarter pounder with socialism or the McMMT. It's good to know that once we run out of food and then we can eat all the dirt and all the weeds growing in between the cracks in the sidewalk, and then if we're still hungry, maybe we'll come back for a Beyond Burger. All right. This really cracked me up. And I, this, this has a special place in my heart because I have lived with vegans before, and it's miserable. It is a miserable experience. I, I've, I've never met, met a more loathsome group of people. And I have a lot of respect for this individual I'm referring to, but never a more loathsome subset of the population than vegans, my goodness. Um, so I have a little special treat. I'm sorry if I'm triggering anybody with my, my talk about the Beyond Burgers and the Beyond Meat, but I have, I have a little piece of ham here. Mm, delicious. Tastes like free market capitalism so good freedom get your stinking socialism out of the meat section put that crap in the produce section where it belongs plants anyway moving on from that that was a little bit of a got a little sidetrack there um the big story today this one broke last night and i can't help but feel a little disappointed Analyst says investors are denied their Evergrande finale for now. You see what they did there? Play on words. Very clever, Mark Jones and Andrew Gale Braith of Reuters. Seems Evergrande, with just a two days or a day and a half left on the clock, made one of their coupon payments last night and thus have bought themselves time in avoiding the inevitable default. Just want to read a little bit here. Investors who have watched China's property sector crisis play out in recent months have just been denied their Evergrande grand finale as the world's most indebted developer dodged a $19 billion default. But they might not have too long to wait. And I have to admit, folks, I was a little disappointed. And maybe that's not good. Maybe I shouldn't be excited at the prospect of Evergrande going bankrupt. But I can't help it. I am. Um, I was disappointed when I read this. I want these crooks to go belly up. You know, I saw that they made their payment, and I had to bring this guy out. No! It's 
great acting. It's just great acting. So yeah, what happened was uh, the last night Evergrande made a uh, was it eighty three million dollars? They made an eighty three million dollar interest only payment on their bonds that they had missed payment on September twenty third. So they have reset the clock on that particular bond payment that they missed. But don't get too excited because all they've done is bought themselves six days because they missed another bond interest payment on September 29th. So in making that payment last night, they have bought themselves a six-day reprieve. So instead of going belly up on the 23rd, now they go belly up on the 29th. Just want to read a little bit more. Their woes have been snowballing for months. Dwindling resources set against $305 billion of liabilities have wiped out 80% of their value. We talked in a video yesterday about how their sales are down 97% year to date. 97%. So I don't know where they came up with their $83 million. But they were able to make that payment. So there is a positive positive out of this. They have not defaulted, said Himanshu Porwal, credit corporate credit analyst at Seaport Global in London. But they're not out of the woods. There is a huge ticking time bomb of $37, $37 billion of short-term debt. And remember, they have been unable to pay or to sell any of their assets. I mean, they, their headquarters deal fell apart. They couldn't sell that. They were going to sell their property management. That fell apart. They couldn't sell that. They were able to sell their bank, but all the proceeds from that sale went to pay back the bank that they were selling. So that, that didn't get them anywhere. So I'll just add here, Evergrande still needs to make an overdue coupon payment of $195 million with the next major deadlines to avoid default on October 29th and November 10th. It then has a further $340 million of international market bond payments due this year and another $6.1 billion due next year, plus tens of billions for local bonds and banks. So Evergrande is by no means out of the woods, by no means. Um but they have bought themselves time. So that is uh, the summary of the update for Evergrande. Let's go to some comments from you guys, see what we have here. Hello, Robin. Hello, Dennis. Hello, everybody. Go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. That is correct, Rusty. Evergrande is going directly to jail. All right. So, we're going to shrink me again. And moving on to our next big story. And oh, there's Mr. Vader again. Boy, this one. This is on FX Street today. This is one of those things that, uh, you know, I just read and it just really made me want to cringe. I, I love reading these sound bites from the Fed governors. Um, you know, I love them like I like being punched in the stomach or slapped in the face over and over again. Um, but some of these comments, you just got to read it. Feds Williams, longer run inflation expectations are in line with the central bank's 2% goal. Are we really talking about that 2% goal again? Is that really back on the table? And what are they saying? Okay, longer run inflation expectations are in line. Here, here we go. This is just the new transitory, longer run. We're not going to define what we mean by longer run. We're not going to say when. Eventually, we'll get back to 2% inflation, you know. Prices may quadruple between now and then, but eventually that 2% number is coming back. We're very confident in our 2% target. And why, again, why do we have a 2% target? Where is it written in stone that says prices must go up over time? We talked about this last, last week in another video. It's, we don't need to have inflation. Inflation is not a good thing. Inflation is a tax. Inflation is headwinds that stifle upward mobility for people who are trying to improve their quality of life. It hits the working class wage earner hardest. So this idea that we must have 2% inflation and that we must just accept that prices go up over time, that is BS, folks. Do not buy into it. That is an artificial headwind that has been placed in our faces to make our lives more difficult by the people who determine monetary policy, and we should not accept it. Okay. That being said, Additional takeaways, New York, New York Fed President John Williams said on Friday that longer run inflation expectations are in line with the central bank's 2% goal. If inflation expectations get anchored at too low a level, that will then bring down actual inflation over time. I don't think 
we have a problem with inflation expectations being set too low anytime soon, Mr. Williams. There's a great deal of uncertainty about the economy today, you think? The U.S. housing prices are rising very rapidly and asset valuations are quite elevated. Well, maybe the reason why asset valuations are quite elevated is because you and your buddies keep printing money and buying the assets. Stop creating money out of thin air and blowing up asset prices with it. There, problem solved. I should be a Fed governor. Man, I'd be good at this. I just solved all their problems. No more printed money. Boom, I'm done. I'm going home. Where's my paycheck? I am a Fed governor. Look at all the problems I just solved. Moving on, house prices were driven higher by low rate environment and pandemic factors, i.e. all of your money printing. Higher home prices are not a risk to financial stability and banks are better capitalized than the, during the last crisis. I argue that point. I don't know that higher home prices are not a risk to financial stability. Talk about people who are being priced out of the housing market. Talk about millennials who are now in their mid-30s, pushing 40 and still have not bought their first home. An entire generation denied the benefit of home ownership. I, I would not be congratulating yourself for this. I really wouldn't. That's just me. And I tell you, we knock on millennials. They, they get a, a, a bum rap. Um, but they've been screwed, all right? They have been screwed. I mean, they, first of all, they grew up watching their parents lose everything in the housing market. And then... As soon as they enter the job market, we start printing tens of trillions of dollars, devaluing their wages. I mean, they, they never had a chance. So I, let's go easy on millennials. We, I like to knock around millennials as much as the next guy, but they kind of get a bum rap. Plus, I don't know, it's probably going to be up to them to solve this mess. I don't know what that looks like. but Now, here's what really, what really killed me. Fed needs to be focused on the security of new payment technologies. And if you don't know what he's talking about, he's talking about Bitcoin. Yes, that is his big concern. The Fed needs to be focused on the security of new payment technologies, not the runaway inflation that they've created, not the everything bubble, the asset bubble that they have overinflated, not the mountain of debt that needs to be refinanced right as interest rates are going up. The situation that's been created by their near zero interest rate policy for 15 years, no. Their concern is Bitcoin. Well, look, John Williams of the New York Fed, the reason why Bitcoin is a concern is because you and your muckety-muck buddies screwed up the money and people got sick of you playing games with their lives and so they went and made their own money and they cut you out of the deal and now you're like, hey, that's my job. It's my job to mess with money and siphon value away from your work and your savings. Hey, give me that back. No, sorry, you can't have it back. We made our own money because your money sucks. That also applies to silver and gold, by the way. Sorry, uh, precious metal maxis. I know some of you guys really get upset when I mention Bitcoin. Don't shoot me. Jeez, I like Bitcoin. I still like silver. I still like gold. Some guys get really upset about that. It's important to think about the positives to digital currencies, but also the risks to consumers, investors, and financial stability. You know what? Every time one of these guys talks about protecting me from myself, I get a little more angry on the inside. Just, just a little. It's like poking that dog in the cage, right? I don't want to be protected from myself. I enjoy my own self-destructive nature. Thank you very much. Oh, nothing, nothing angers free market, capitalist, libertarian type more than the arrogance of people who say you need to be protected from yourself. No, I do not. Thank you very much. <sighs> Anyways, so considering the fact that these guys seem so unconcerned about inflation, there's a couple of things I thought I would point out. Because in the last few CPE reads, there's been a couple of issues that have been creeping up on us that I really think we are long overdue for some very big CPI numbers. Let's start with the first one. The Fed's key inflation gauge. And this is talking about rents. In particular, my least favorite statistic, owner's equivalent rent. You may wonder why rent is included in the CPI, but not food and energy. The Fed considers 
Price fluctuations in food and energy as transitory. I love that, I love that word. If, for example, OPEC decides to raise oil production next month, the price of oil would probably decline. That, in turn, would likely impact how much consumers pay at the pump. Rents, on the other hand, are stickier and tend to last longer. It's obvious to most readers that housing costs have skyrocketed during the last two years. Since the start of the pandemic, inflation-adjusted home prices have increased 11.8% annualized. To put that in perspective, real house prices have been rising 100 times faster than they did from 90. 1955 to 1998. That number really surprised me when I read that. I want to read that one again. Real house prices have been rising 100 times faster than they did from 1955 to 1998. That's a pretty potent data point right now. You, you think we don't have a problem with housing prices when they're rising 100 times faster than they did for almost 50 years? Wages sure as heck aren't rising that fast. Incomes aren't going up that fast. So where's all that money coming from? It's coming from printing, quantitative easing, and debt. That's where it's coming from. And remember our Fed governor in the last one was talking about how home prices are not a risk to financial security. Yeah, okay. Prices rising 100 times faster than they did for 50 years in the last generation. Oh boy. But there has been no commensurate increase in OER until recently. OER is owner's equivalent rent. That is because there is usually a big lag between increased housing prices and rent increases by roughly five quarters. That lag time is now up, and right on schedule, we're beginning to see OER impact the inflation rate in both CPI and PPI. So What they're saying is that lag is now over, and the rent is about to start going up, according to the Federal Reserve's BS, Owner's Equivalent Rent Statistic. So that is one huge factor in inflation that is about to drive that number higher and higher. But wait, there's more. Used cars for sale. More used cars for sale, but prices still rising. Remember a few months ago, one of the biggest inputs in the CPI read, Jerome Powell went on TV and said, well, it's because of used car prices. But we believe that's isolated and that's now sorted itself out and it's transitory and all those. It's going to go away. It's going to go away all by itself. That was... What, May, June, he was talking about that? Well, despite inventory starting to recover, prices continued their rise. The average used vehicle list price at the end of September was $26,646. That is 25% higher than just one year before. The average list price surpassed $25,000 for the first time in August. The pace of increase has accelerated every week since spring, Cox Automotive reports combination of factors has driven the surge. A worldwide chip shortage has left automakers unable to build new cars fast enough to meet demand. That has sent new car prices soaring. The average new car sold for $45,000 in September. So it's getting more expensive to sleep. It's getting more expensive to drive. What could make this inflation problem better? Oh, I don't know. Let's talk about energy. Ooh, there's another one. All parts of supply chains are affected by higher prices for oil, natural gas, and coal. Real Money's Action Alerts Plus team writes. This is on thestreet.com. Not my favorite website, but I found this interesting. Energy prices are built into absolutely every step of the production chain. Consumer prices reflect the energy it costs to run manufacturing machines, the price of fuel for boats and planes to ship those products around the world, the price of gas to drive those products the last mile, the price of electricity in every office attached to those processes, and much more. The effect is that this adds overhead to literally every pair of hands that touches a product in the supply chain, which means rising energy prices will almost certainly contribute to ongoing concerns of inflation. So I just want to point out those three things. The rent has gone up, the cars are more expensive, and the energy is making everything else more expensive. Meanwhile, this guy over at the New York Fed is saying longer run expectations are in line with our 2% goal. Again, where do they find these guys? Where do they get them? It sure as heck ain't the world I live in. So with that, let's uh, read a couple of your comments. It's going to blow. This is from uh, Mike Robin. It's going to blow. It's almost certain they have outdone themselves. It's like with the Titanic, believed to be unsinkable, hence full steam into the iceberg field. Mike, that's funny because I, I used that analogy just the other day. Somebody in Twitter 
I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody with a decent sized following in Twitter said something to the tune of the U.S. dollar could not be debased because it's the world's reserve currency. As if there is no limit to the amount of money we can print, it won't affect the strength of the dollar because it's the world's reserve currency. And I replied to that person in quotes. I was quoting uh, Thomas Andrews, the engineer who designed the Titanic, who said, she's made of iron, sir. I assure you she can sink, and she will. Because the kind of people who use phrases like, you cannot debase the dollar, are the kind of idiots that get quoted in history books for being monumentally wrong. So it's funny you should mention the Titanic analogy, Mike. That's very accurate, very, very appropriate. As a millennial, I think the only way I will afford a house is when silver's value actually gets discovered. Uh, Zebel Fritz, I could tell you, I, I don't know what to tell a millennial right now when it comes to the housing market, right? Certainly renting for life is, is not desirable, right? There's so many benefits that come with owning a home, the forced savings, the depreciation of debt over time, you know, as inflation erodes away the value of the debt, the tax incentives. Uh, however, we are talking today about no FOMO and buying in today's prices, it does seem a little FOMO-y and take it from me, I FOMO'd in 2006 and I paid for it. I lost almost $100,000 in my first house. I got crushed my first entry into real estate. So maybe I'm not the best one to listen to in that department. Um, but if you talk to guys like the Economic Ninja, I mean, he called the top in the housing market a couple of months ago. Um, I wasn't there yet. I, I still don't think we're at a top, but I do see signs that we are definitely nearing a top. But again, we have these two monumental forces in the world. We've got this inflation that we just talked about for so long that's just running rampant, that's driving up the price of everything, including houses. Then you also have the prospect of a, you know, the, the asset bubble, the everything bubble popping. That would be hugely deflationary if that were to happen. And it, it, you know, I, I, I'm really torn which way to go. Like right now, it's all leading towards inflation. All the forces are inflationary and the dollar becoming worthless. But you have this story building in China. You have the taper on the horizon. You have rising interest rates, all things that could pop this bubble. So don't despair just yet, Zeeble. This, this market may give you a buying opportunity. All right. And there are also, you know, certain markets... You know, you could buy undeveloped land and you could build a house, you know, wait for material prices to come in or maybe supply chain. There's things you could do. Um, just don't feel pressured to go overpay. Don't, again, not financial advice, not a financial advisor, but no FOMO. That's, that's all I'm going to say when it comes to that. Rusty says, I don't get mad when you mention Bitcoin. Thank you, Rusty. Some do. Some, some, guys, some guys can't get past the intangibility of a Bitcoin. And I've, I, I do try to listen very intently when Bitcoin bears talk about what they don't like about it. And, and I, it seems to boil down with the biggest hang up for them is the fact that it is intangible and that you can't hold it. And it tends to be diehard precious metal types of which I am one, you know, I'm definitely a big precious metal guys. And the thing I like about precious metals is that I hold it. I own it, right? It's got a physical presence that you know I control and that is pretty much the opposite of Bitcoin right at least in the physical world um, Bitcoin is not tangible but then again neither is your checking account neither is your stock brokerages right how many people who own stocks actually hold paper certificates of their shares I'm willing to bet nobody maybe somebody on this live stream has like a framed Disney share that they got as a kid 50 years ago or something like that um, but nobody holds their stock certificates, right? They're all held by TD Ameritrade or Robinhood or whoever. So most of our investments, folks, is not tangible. So I really wonder this, this I can't hold my Bitcoin so it's not real thing. That Applying that standard to your checking account, to your stocks, to your brokers, to your 401k, you end up with the same problem. And then there's a lot of, you know, the tether story is out there. That's real. And, you know, the exchanges, I'm not a big fan of the exchanges. They are run by crooks um, that go down for maintenance. Every time there's a big sell-off, the exchanges have these issues. So, you know, I always say don't leave your coins on the exchange. But I, I've gotten past the it's not physical, you can't hold it. 
And it's not like I've taken out the code and gone line for line through the binary ones and zeros. And, you know, I'm not a software guy, but I know enough about it to believe in the security, the scarcity, the fungibility, the decentralized nature of it, the durability of it. It meets most of the qualities of money. So anyways, some, some guys just really get hung up on that. It's invisible. It's intangible. You mean to tell me that Fort Knox is empty? Say it ain't so, Rusty. Say it ain't so. Inflation is transitory, but then they say it in its line. But they say it's in line. Crazy. Yeah, t Dogs. I, I don't get that. I, I think the Fed is kind of getting rid of the transitory talking point. I think they realize that, that they played that card too much already. Sirloin steaks now eight ninety nine a pound versus pre COVID five ninety nine a pound. Yeah, I'm definitely noticing the uh, the price of meat is going up, but again, nobody's buying that tofu crap. <laughs> that cracked me up. I have noticed that there are a lot of people that just can't understand that Bitcoin is divisible, so they don't need to dump sixty k at once. I haven't really seen that problem, Zebel. Um, I've I've seen a lot of people complain that Bitcoin as a money it doesn't really fulfill the promise of as a currency that it was initially envisioned as. And I guess I can see that because it's still very difficult to transact in Bitcoin. I mean, if you're a big tech guy, you could be like, oh, it's so easy. You know, I tell you, anytime I transact in Bitcoin, I get really, really nervous. Like I'm going to mess something up and lose my coin forever. I get so nervous when I move my Bitcoin around. Like when I pull it off the exchange and into my, uh, into my cold storage or, or, you know, when I get payouts from the mining pool into my wallet, I'm always so worried that I'm going to get one character wrong and lose it forever. So I can't imagine going through that every time I buy a cup of coffee. So I don't really buy the Bitcoin as a, as a currency, at least not for small transactions. As an asset class, though, I love it. I mean, it's, it's one of the most efficient. I mean, if you're talking about, like, moving money across invisible lines, one of the reasons why I think it's going to work out well for El Salvador is because El Salvador is very dependent on remittances. People working like in the States and sending their money back to family in El Salvador. You know, before Bitcoin, their only option was Western Union and they would charge an arm and a leg. I mean, they were just robbing these guys blind. Now they just put it in their Bitcoin wallet. It's there, you know. They, they pay the transaction fees and the Bitcoin transaction fees can be can be tough. But, you know, now that there's Lightning Network and, and other things, the fees have really come down they're still a little prohibitive for everyday transactions, but they're better than Western Union, I can tell you that. So if you're, you know, if, if you're one of those people that unfortunately you have to go to another country to make a living wage and then send your money back to your family, Bitcoin is an opportunity for you because you can't, you can't get a, a social security number or a bank account and then you have to pay these exorbitant fees and then there's uh, foreign exchange rates, and they always rip you off. So many people who rip you off every step of the way, and Bitcoin gives you a way around that. So I, I think it's going to work out pretty well for El Salvador. The one thing it may backfire is the traditional finance world may try to make life difficult for El Salvador, make an example out of them, and th then it may backfire, but we'll see. All right. I think we beat, the, we beat the inflation horse to death today. Moving on to that, there is, since we were talking about energy, I just want to talk about this one. Again, not financial advice, not a financial advisor. Um, this is Chenier Energy, ticker symbol, symbol LNG. This is what I've been talking about for a little while now. Um, Chenier owns the Corpus Christi and the Saving Pass natural gas liquefaction facilities in the United States. They take natural gas from the U.S. where it is very cheap. They super cool it down to its liquid form. They load it on the boats and they sell it into Europe and into Asia, where right now the LNG costs are through the roof. And so this is a very good way to play this run-up in natural gas prices in Europe and in Asia. Now, again, I just want to say today's theme is no FOMO, so we are not chasing. And the reason I say that is because Chenier has had one heck of a run. Let's move this where you can see it. So this is a one-year chart, and you can see, I mean, we're up almost 100% year-to-date, all right? And it's just gone parabolic these last couple of weeks. 
So I am not adding at this level. Somebody asked me on Twitter, you know, at, when are you looking to add? My cost basis is down in the 60s on this one. So right now I'm not looking to add. I'm very happy with my position. It's almost doubled. I'm not selling anytime soon because I think it's got more room to run. But I'm also not adding at this level because I'm just looking at this this gap between the 50-day moving average and its current price, right? This gap right here. I think we may get a better buying opportunity. If you look even through this whole year, it spent most of the year kind of stuck above the 50-day line, but not much above it. And right now, I think we've just gone a little too far too fast. And I think the market may give us a buying opportunity in the not too distant future. I would let this one come in a little bit. Again, not financial advice, not a financial advisor, CYA, CYA. But if I see this go below 100, I may think about adding. Um, right now, it just it got a little bit overheated. So I'm looking for this one to come in. But this is a very good way to play the arbitrage, the difference between the prices in the U.S. and Europe and Asia. And the other thing is right now what LNG is doing is they're taking advantage of these higher prices and they're signing long-term supply agreements with buyers overseas. So they're taking advantage of these higher prices to lock in profits for future years. So this is a very good time for LNG. All right. Moving on from that one, I want to talk about my favorite of the shiny metals, silver. And again, folks, while we're talking about silver, I want to draw your attention to today's password, no FOMO. Because look at this chart of silver. Now, let me just preface by saying I dollar cost average into silver. I buy a little bit at a time on a regular basis. I don't try to time the markets. Why? Because of these price smashes and these crooks that run it. However, just very cursory glance at this chart, you can see we're at a little bit of price resistance around this 2450 level. We broke well above this. We touched 25, but that price was very promptly rejected this month. And now here we are struggling to break above this 2450 level. And the reason I say this is because silver is just prone to these massive price smashes and you know, I'll be honest with you. Here's a six-month chart. I mean, look at these just huge down steps. These are these, you know, period of low liquidity, Sunday night price smashes by the bullion banks. And they've been doing this for a year now. I mean, look at a one-year chart. They've just beaten this down. Silver prices have wanted to rise. All the fundamentals have been there. All the technicals have been there. But they just keep manipulating the price. But the stocks are starting to get low. The COMEX inventory is getting lower. The inflation story is getting more and more potent. So silver could be poised to rise. However, because no FOMO, I would look, before I add, I would look for the next price smash to give us a discount. At least, uh, just doing a cursory glance, I think we could probably get in below 24, maybe 23.50. Again, I'm not an expert. If there's one thing you could set your watch by, it's by me being wrong about silver in 2021. Um, but here's why I really like silver. All right. And I just want to point to this. This is the visual capitalist, which is just an amazing website. I love this site. And they did this a few days ago, visualizing the global, global silver supply chain. And it talks a little bit about the countries where it comes from. But here is this chart that I really like. Let's make sure you guys can see. Let's get me out of the way. And this is showing, it's a little weird. It's a half a pie chart. Okay, but this half a pie represents the whole pie, apparently. But this is showing where the silver comes from. And I talked about this in a video um, last week. And I'm going to keep drawing attention to this because I think this is going to be a very big story. Maybe not yet, but I think this is going to be big because... You'll see more than half. Here we have 57% of all silver comes from lead, zinc, and copper mines. Only 27% of silver comes from an actual silver mine. Now, I did a video about this last night, and I think there was some misunderstanding. There were some people in Reddit who interpreted the headline of my video as if to say, I'm bearish on silver miners. Absolutely not the case. Okay, I'm definitely not bearish on silver miners. But you look at this chart, silver miners only makes up 27% of silver supply. 
I am bearish on the supply of silver because I think this pie is going to get smaller because lead, zinc, and copper miners are going to be put out of business in the coming year. That's my theory. Not that I think silver is not going to go up in value. And I see what the metal prices are doing right now on the exchanges. Copper, my God, what happened at the LME? But I see all of these problems in the supply chain, these high energy costs, the factories shutting down, the refiners and the smelters shutting down. This is bad news for base metal miners. For the people who mine the lead, the zinc, and the copper, pretty soon they're going to have nowhere to send that ore because those smelters are going to be shut down. The ore is going to pile up on the docks, and that's going to drive the value of the ore down, regardless of what the price of the finished metal is doing. Because the main driver of the price of the finished metal is not going to be the supply of ore. It's going to be the supply of energy to turn that ore into purified metal. And I think these miners, these lead, zinc, and copper miners, I think they're going to start going out of business. Their labor costs are going up. Their energy costs are going up. And their consumers, their customers, are getting squeezed by this energy crisis. I think a lot of these mines are going to shut down. And again, that's just talking about the energy. My God, what happens if the real estate market in China doesn't improve? Because China is half of the world's copper and half of the world's steel consumption. And steel consumption, think zinc, because zinc is used to galvanize steel for structural metals. So if the, if the Chinese housing market doesn't recover, which you saw that article or the video I did yesterday, 97% sales reduction for Evergrande, 97%. Pretty soon, nothing is going to be getting built in China. And that means that steel and that copper is not going to be needed. And those miners are going to shut down. And I want you to remember, because as far as I know, all right, I rarely do this, but as far as I know, I am the first human being on planet Earth who talked about this. And if you can find an article or a discussion board that predates my video I did last week about this topic, please point it out to me and I will humble myself before whoever it was came up with this idea before I did. But as far as I know, I am the only one who was talking about this last week because I want to point out this article. Silver supply doubts grow as Australia gears up to bring on mines. Now, this is in smallcaps.com. This is not a big media outlet, okay? This is a relatively small website. But this article is saying exactly what I have been saying. And I want to zoom in on here. Signs are emerging that the silver sector is facing a shakeup and one that could play into the hands of primary producers of the metal. Okay, I want to emphasize that. Primary producers of the metal. That's talking about these guys. These these 27% guys over here. That is not who I was talking about in my video yesterday. My video yesterday about miners getting crushed was talking about these guys, the copper, the lead, and the zinc. Okay, But primary producers of the metal could be a good play. This is coming at a time when Australia's silver sector has sprung back to life after years of dwelling in the doldrums, and all the four leading contenders have one advanced, pro one advanced projects and two will be primary producers of the metal rather than byproduct suppliers. Again, you notice the difference they're drawing here. There's the primary producers and there's the byproduct suppliers. Okay, The copper and the zinc mines that accidentally produce silver, they're the ones that are in trouble. The silver miners themselves are set up for success here. That latter factor is important if, as seems increasingly likely, base metals output may find some short-term challenges, and that may mean their silver byproduct output could be affected. Now, they talk a little bit here about China is cutting off commodities, talking about the zinc foundries and the magnesium story, which pay attention to that magnesium story. That could hit the car, mar the car market big time. But I want to scroll down to this part. Primary producers in safe jurisdictions could be in the box seat. There are other issues clouding the silver outlook. China's falling demand for copper, zinc, and lead could ricochet through the silver sector. In 2020, only 27% of the world's silver supply came from primary producers of the metal. Copper miners provided 25% of the world's silver. Zinc and letters produced another 32. So they are saying exactly what I said. All right, and 
I just, I just want to clarify, all right? I, folks, I will rarely do this, but I got there first. There, I said it, all right? The story about the lead, zinc, and copper. If you can find an article that predates my video about the lead and the zinc miners affecting silver supply, please point it out to me, and I will humbly give them the credit for it, okay? But that one is all me. And I called that a long time ago, and I'm sticking by that call. I think silver supply is going down, all right? I think there has been, since the 1990s, a huge increase in global silver supply, and it has been the result of all of the copper and zinc that has been mined in order to feed China's appetite for growth. China's appetite for growth, they've got indigestion now. Way too much of it. China's growth is about to fall off a cliff. Their building is going to fall off a cliff. And all that copper and zinc that we've been digging up to send to China, that demand is going to dry up, which means those copper and those zinc mines, the price they get for their metals is going to fall. And a lot of those mines are going to shut down. Their output is going to go down. And if there's less copper and there's less zinc coming out of the ground, there's going to be less silver coming out of the ground. And if we return back to pre-2005, like late 90s level silver, you're talking about almost a 50% reduction in the supply of silver. That's at a time as demand for silver due to inflation and solar panels and what have you is going through the roof. So I think the collapse of the housing market in China is going to be hugely, hugely bullish for the price of silver. It may take over a year to play out, but I think... and if I'm wrong about this, a year from now, two years from now, I'll circle back and say I got this one wrong. But I think we are going to see a huge decline in the supply of silver in the coming years. And again, I got there first. As far as I know, I was the first one to call that. So with that, let's get into a couple of comments. Dumb Money Media, sir, thank you very much for the super chat, for supporting the channel. Since I love shilling, sign up for free Silverfest 2 event. I may be doing a vid, who knows, hopefully the vid doesn't suck too bad, huh? Dumb, your videos definitely do not suck. Um, Silverfest 2, I believe that is next month. I'm not sure when that's coming, but uh, put a link in, in the comments. We will definitely talk about that. And are you doing a video about Silverfest 2? Looking forward to seeing that. I still want to see that video about Evergram, by the way. And Mike Robin, sir, thank you also for supporting the channel with your super chats. Have another piece of ham for our vegan friends. Yes, tastes like freedom. Thank you, sir. I will definitely enjoy some ham on you. And Don T seventy seven, thank you very much for the super chat for supporting the channel. Jack, I often hear you say that you are in cash accumulation mode. Are you concerned that the value of those USDs could depreciate, perhaps suddenly? Yes. Um, Don, that is an excellent question. I am in cash raising mode. I am still in cash raising, mo raising mode. And yes, I'm very acutely aware that I'm effectively paying somewhere between 5 and 10% to hold that cash right now. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, I was in cash dumping mode. I was buying cryptocurrencies. I was buying gold and silver. I'm still buying all of those things. But I'm buying less stocks now, I guess is really really what it is. I'm still dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. I'm still mining Ethereum. I still dollar cost average into silver and gold. Um, but I'm not buying stocks right now. I'm looking to take profits in stocks. Uh, we'll talk about one that I sold in a couple of minutes here recently. Uh, there's a lot of stocks that I have my eye on, a lot of ETFs that I have my eye on, but I'm not chasing, again, the topic today, no FOMO. We are not chasing at these valuations because I see what's going on in silver and I see what's going on with these energy prices and this is gonna hit every company's earnings all right I, I mean everybody Apple makes iPhones in China you tell me the Apple factories haven't been affected or the chip shortage hasn't affected Apple's iPhones to energy costs and I think a lot of very good companies that are arguably at decent valuations right now, are going to get cheaper in the near term. And Don, to your point, I'm willing to eat the cost to carry that cash right now via inflation because I think it will pay to wait. I think those companies like, say, LNG I was looking at a little while ago, I think they will be coming in in the not-too-distant future because if there is a broad market sell-off because of panic from the inflation, 
I think we'll be able to get these at much lower prices where it's it's worthwhile to eat the cost. Now, that being said, as I'm raising cash in my brokerage account, again, I'm continuing the dollar cost average into inflation hedges such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, gold, and silver. I hope that answered your question. Um, excellent question, by the way. And you need to keep that in mind, right? Holding cash is an expense, right? When you leave large amounts of wealth sitting in dollars, don't pay so much attention to that nominal value. Think about how much stuff that gets. And right now, the amount of stuff those dollars get you is in decline. According to the government, it's in decline by about 5%. I think it's a lot more than that. It's probably actual inflation. If you factor in everything, probably somewhere around 10, maybe even 15. Again, if, if we were to measure inflation the same way we did back in the 70s, we'd probably be over 15% right now. Dumb Money Media, sir, thank you again for the super chat. DM me on Twitter. I'll show you some of the random stuff i got going on right now. See if I can find an appropriate spot to put you in a vid. Well, just get my good side if you do. Do I have a good side? Anyone? I hope. Definitely not here. It's definitely not the bald spot. That's not the good side. So, luckily the bald spot is the last thing you guys are going to see. But It's embarrassing. It's not just the boat slips. I got the boat slips and I got the bald spot. I'm 41, so sue me. Anyways, thank you guys uh, very much for the Super Chats, for supporting the channel. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And we must now press on. Now that I tooted my own horn about the silver, I just want to mention this one. What happens if the world's key metal exchange has no metal? And we were just talking about silver. And, you know, if you guys followed me from the Wall Street Silver days, which I think most of you probably came over from Wall Street Silver. Um, I was very big on this smashing of the COMEX. I still would love to see it. And I think we kind of got a little preview of the shenanigans and what that would look like if it ever came down to it with silver. And Rafi Farber did an excellent video on this today. Um, I highly recommend his channel, by the way. Um, he's been talking a lot about backwardation recently. If you're not familiar with backwardation, that is when the spot price of a commodity is higher than the future price of it. Now, typically, a futures price is going to be more expensive than a commodity because there's that time element and there's that little bit of, well, prices could go up over time. You tend to pay a little bit more for a future than you do on the spot, except when there's shortages building up. That's when futures, the spot market, becomes more expensive than the future. That's called backwardation. And that usually means there is a shortage where people will pay more to get it today than they will to wait for it a few months. And we have deep, deep backwardation in the metal space right now. And the London Metals Exchange, which sets the price of copper, one of the most important metals, um, they almost ran out of copper this week. It's a story I'm surprised didn't get more coverage than it deserved. Um, but they pulled a lot of, a lot of sneaky stuff. And, I don't know who this guy is right here in this Bloomberg article, but when I think of the kind of people that are behind the scenes ripping us off by screwing around with the rules and changing the rules at the last minute to suit their positions in their trades, well, let's just say this is the kind of people that I picture. Anyway, I don't know who that is. Maybe he's a nice guy. <laughs> it's probably shallow of me, but uh, I would want to read a little bit from this. What happens when the London Metal Exchange runs out of metal? That's the question the exchange is urgently trying to address for its flagship copper contract, which sets the global price for one of the world's most important commodities. The problem stems from the LME's physical nature. Anyone holding a contract to expiration becomes the owner of a package of metal in an LME warehouse. On the other end, anyone who sold one must deliver the metal when the contract expires. What a concept. People who buy futures take delivery of metal, and people who sell those futures short have to supply the metal. What an incredible concept. Are you paying attention, COMEX silver market? That's how a market is supposed to work. However, when things got tight this week, the LME went and changed their own rules to benefit the shorts. And again, you play chess with the same people over and over again, you learn that their first three moves are usually the same. This brings me to this little gem. London Metal Exchange has to restrain disorderly copper. 
And this is an article written by one of these market manipulators for other market manipulators. Because if you were long copper, you didn't need the London Metal Exchange to come to your rescue. I mean, if you were one of the people who were long copper, you got screwed by the LME this week. Because they came in and they changed the rules to benefit the shorts. Does this sound familiar, Silver Squeeze? I just want to read you a little bit of what they did. The London Metals Exchange was forced to apply the restraints as a ferocious squeeze rocked the markets. Forced to apply the restraints. Think tamp down, Rostin Venom. With the premium for cash metal spiraling out of control to an unprecedented $1,100 per ton at one stage on Monday as the exchange's monthly prompt date descended into chaos. The London copper contract has been sucked into a stock's vacuum after the amount of available metal in the LME's global warehouse system sank to just 14,150 tons last Friday, the lowest since 1974. The rest of the 181,000 tons had been canceled in preparation for loadout, meaning it was off the table in terms of monthly reconciliation. But what happened, folks, is they ran out of copper. Right? Everything that we've been hoping was going to happen with the silver squeeze all year, it happened in copper this week. And I can't believe we haven't heard more about it. I can't believe it wasn't front page. Maybe the muckety mucks at CNBC don't want us knowing about this, don't want us knowing that this can be done. Because it happened. They ran out of copper. They were down to 14,000 tons. Who grabbed all the copper? Trafigura, for one, the trading powerhouse, said it had indeed been hoovering up LME stocks, but said it had that others had also been involved in the string of stock cancellations that depleted available tonnage for more than 168,000 tons in the middle of September. Now, what they basically did was they came in and they allowed the shorts to roll over their contracts. They, let me, here, let me scroll down here, a lot of this. Special measures. Here it is. The LME, which said it had been monitoring the ongoing tightness in the copper market with exchange inventories falling and near, nearby carries tightening, evidently decided the chaos was only going to continue as shorts tried to roll their way out of danger. Or rather, its special committee did. The body with the uninspired title was created to avoid the potential for conflicts of interest that had dogged the full LME board during this previous event in the 70s. So here's what they did. Long story short, they changed the rules to suit them at the last minute to avoid the price from going any higher. So that is what they will do if Silver Squeeze happens again. They'll change their rules again. They'll bail out the shorts, and they'll probably do it at the long's expense. Okay. Now, the reason why I say this is not to scare you out of buying silver. Again, not a financial advisor. I continue to buy silver, but I just want to reemphasize no FOMO. That is the theme today. We're going to repeat it. Say it over and over again. No FOMO. If you see something like happened with copper, if you see that happening again with silver and you are tempted to FOMO into silver in the middle of the night because it looks like the COMEX is being smashed, keep in mind, if you're playing that paper game, they will change their rules and they will screw you. You will be SOL. It's what they did in February. They did it to me. I lost a ton of money in derivatives when they did that. And I've lost a ton of money since in derivatives because they have smashed the price over and over and over again. So just keep in mind, no FOMO. And things like Bitcoin, things like silver, these are markets that are notorious for FOMO buying, fueling these rallies, and then big drops follow. Okay, Don't be the one who buys at the top. Wait for your opportunity. Again, covering my butt. Not financial advice. Not a financial advisor. All right. And while we're on that subject, I just want to draw attention to this little gem. Deutsche Bank whistleblower gets $200 million bounty for tip on LIBOR misconduct. This is a very big story, potentially. And the reason I say this is you COMEX LBMA crooks that are out there. Keep in mind here. Anybody who's out there who knows about this manipulation and this fraud that is going on in the precious metals market, keep in mind somebody at Deutsche Bank who blew the whistle on the LIBOR manipulation was just awarded $200 million cash U.S. The 
people who blew the whistle on that scandal were entitled to a portion of the fines and penalties collected as a result of that prosecution. And Deutsche Bank paid billions. It was over a billion dollars for this scandal. And the person who blew the whistle on it, after some legal deliberation, was awarded $200 million in cash. So keep that in mind. If you're sitting at one of these trading desks at J.P. Morgan, if you work at the LBMA, if you work at the COMEX, and you know what they're doing, what we all know they're doing, and you have proof of it, somebody just got $200 million to blow the whistle on Deutsche Bank. How much do you think you could get if you blow the whistle on what we all know is happening? that the price of precious metals is rigged. I just throw them out there, folks. You do what you want with them. But that's a very juicy payday that people may be tempted to cash in on. Reading a few more of these, I just want to catch up on the comments. I feel safe in precious metals right now. I sleep well having a hedge. Rusty, I know the feeling, and I, know I, I feel exactly the same way. Uh, Chedka, nickel, same boat. I have heard of some of nickel prices going up. I haven't seen any particular examples of nickel refiners or nickel mines having the kind of problem like the zinc smelters have had. Okay, I haven't seen I haven't seen a specific example of nickel. If I see if I see that, I'll do a video on it. Um, I have seen the magnesium, and I have seen the zinc, and that affects aluminum. That affects steel. So nickel nickel is used in alloys of brass, bronze, special. Manel steel, so I, I don't know. Maybe that's going on, but I haven't seen the story of it. Rusty Benhammer, I stack all metals: copper, copper, aluminum, nickel, silver, gold, platinum. You know, I have some weird hobbies too, Rusty. Um, I like to take my kids to thrift shops. Um, they do jobs; they earn money around the house, um, and I like to teach them number one the value of a work ethic, but number two, I want to teach them how far their dollars can go. And they like to pick out toys at thrift shops and yard sales because they have realized that they can get way more toy for their buck at a yard sale or at a thrift shop than they can in the toy aisle at Target where the stuff seems really overpriced for them. So I let them earn their own dough and then they go out and they spend it, but I've shown them where it can go farthest. And while we're at yard sales and why we go to thrift shops from time to time, you know, it's, it's mainly for a financial education for my kids. But for about the last year and a half, I have been buying up just about every piece of pewter that I could get my hands on. And the reason why is tin, or pewter is, I think, 92% tin, and then the rest is usually like antimony or copper. Um, you know, I'm like picture frames that are a dollar, or like old pewter statues that are two or three dollars. Like, I try to gauge the weight of it and see if I try not to overpay too much. Um, but I got a pretty big pretty big box full of pewter accumulated in my garage right now. What I think I'm going to do at some point on a maybe a boring day this winter when there's nothing to do is I'll take out my camp stove and I'll, I'll melt it all down in the little biscuits. And I just want to see what I can get for these little bricks of pewter um, because I've been paying pennies on the dollar for the scrap value of the metal. And right now, tin futures are like $37,000 a ton or something like that. Um, so, you know, you mentioned you stack all metals. Yeah, I, I guess I just have some weird hobbies, you know? Some guys golf. Some guys play video games. I buy pewter. I stack metal. What can I say? I'm weird. I don't get out much. Whatever. I do me. The closer, the closer copper gets to silver, the more undervalued silver looks. I agree with that, Rusty. Um, and, and copper is, you know, where gold is your pure monetary metal, copper is your pure industrial metal, silver is nestled right in between. So maybe copper and all these base metals and what's happening in those markets is going to drag silver with it. I think silver is the next logical step. And I, again, you have that big asterisk. My, my only hesitation in silver, my only hesitation, it's not fundamental, it's not technical, it has nothing to do with the economy, it's the fact that the market is dominated by crooks. That's my only fundamental. That's my only hesitation, right? And, and I would be, I'd be diving headfirst into silver derivatives right now if it wasn't for the fact that it's such a manipulated market. And I, I've been burned way too much. So I'm just dollar cost averaging into the physical. That's, I, I'm limiting myself. I just lost too much money in mining stocks and derivatives over the course of the last year to keep letting these crooks rip me off. 
So, I mean, maybe maybe that's the capitulation that marks the bottom. You know, take that what you will. Because, again, you can mark your watch by me. You can set your watch by me being wrong about silver. Jack, will you tell us why Bitcoin is perceived as limited to 21 million when each coin is divisible and price is variable? Why it's limited? Well, Bitcoin itself as a unit is factually limited to 21 million, right? There, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. Now, that being said, Bitcoin is divisible up to one, I believe it's 100 millionth of a Bitcoin, which is referred to as a Satoshi. So, I, Donald, I, I, you know, there's nothing forcing you to transact in whole Bitcoin amounts, right? Just like there's nothing forcing you to transact in whole dollar amounts. A dollar is divisible by 100, by pennies, right? And, you know, a Satoshi is a one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. And they could always fork it to make it more fungible. But when you make it more fungible, you don't increase the supply, okay? Uh, the fact that Bitcoin can be divided by a 100 millionth does not increase the total supply of Bitcoin. Now, I have heard people argue that the supply of Bitcoin isn't limited because there are other cryptocurrencies, you know, like the fact that there's Ethereum and there's Litecoin proves that Bitcoin's not limited, which... I see the reasoning there because somebody could just copy Bitcoin and create a copy of it, then Bitcoin's price is therefore not limited. But if that were true, then all these other altcoins would be trading at the same value as Bitcoin. Maybe not 64,000, maybe they'd all be trading at 2,000. If it was true that somebody could just copy the code and create their own version of Bitcoin and therefore increase the supply. It doesn't really work. It, I see the logic, but it doesn't work. That's like saying because there's aluminum and because there's iron and copper, gold shouldn't be worth that much because we could always just buy copper, and that's also a metal. Yeah, but it has different properties. It's, it's not gold. It's, it's a different thing entirely, kind of like these other cryptocurrencies are different things entirely. They may bear resemblances to it, right? I mean, some people can't tell the difference between a bar of brass and a bar of gold. If you don't spend a lot of time around precious metals, you might think one is the other. And, you know, there's silver plating makes something look like solid silver, but that doesn't diminish the value of silver. I hope I, hope I explained that well. Anyway. All right. We are going to shrink me a little bit more. And I want to get into, I mentioned that there was one stock that I was selling, and I just want to cover real quick some of these articles here. Steady and container rates belie global volatility. And... This has to do with the supply chain. Now, let me just preface this entire segment by saying supply chain problems are not over. They are only just beginning. They're going to get worse before they get better. That being said, I think we are at the peak shipping aspect of it. All right, I, I see the problems in the supply chain have migrated further upstream to now they're affecting the fertilizer. They're affecting the base metals. They're affecting the factories, right? So the rate at which things are produced now is being slowed. And I think that is going to lower the cost to ship things because now the bottleneck is not just offloading the boats. Now the bottleneck is also loading the boats, which means there's not as big a line to get the stuff on a boat, or at least that line is about to get shorter. Number one, the peak holiday season is now behind us. Um, if it's not already on a boat, it's not getting here in time for Christmas. So nobody is paying up big dollars to get anything on a boat right now in time for the holiday season. So I, it's hard to tell when you're at a top. Market tops don't always announce themselves, okay? And I may be early on this, but I think shipping has peaked. And I just, I just want to get into a couple of the points that, that support that. Number one, here is a chart. Let's move me. No, not the chart. We're going to move me. All right. This chart is showing ocean container prices for a 40-foot container. All right. And you see we peaked in September. And, folks, that looks like a head and shoulders pattern forming right there, doesn't it? Doesn't that look like a head and shoulders reversal pattern forming? We're definitely way down from our peaks. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got the round-the-clock working at the ports now. And the fact that the factories are shutting down in China and the fact that the, the base metal producers are having difficulty now, there's not going to be as much stuff to ship 
very soon because everything, the production of everything is slowing. And if the production slows, then the shipping slows with it. That's what I'm trying, I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. Production slowing equals shipping slowing. We're already seeing that in the charts. I think we're at peak shipping congestion. That doesn't mean supply chain problems are going away. Bigger supply, much bigger supply chain problems now. They're just at a different point in the supply chain. And I want to draw attention to this. Rates are showing, this is on uh, KIT 1280 AM. I don't know this station, but I want to point to something they're saying here. Container rates, let's make sure, get me out of the way. Container rates are showing signs of easing, at least temporarily, on the Shanghai to Los Angeles trade route. The rate for a 40-foot container fell nearly $1,000 last week, an 8.2% drop from the prior week. I'll say, however, according to Bloomberg, ocean freight remains more expensive than it was pre-pandemic, and air cargo rates remain elevated. So what it boils down to is I think we have peaked. That's not to say everything is fine on the high seas. I think they've gotten as bad as they're going to get on the high seas. I think the problems are now elsewhere. And the reason I say that is because during a lot of my previous streams, I talked about this stock, Deneos, which is a ocean freight carrier. All right, and I, I mentioned last week during my stream that I had started to exit my position in this carrier, and I finished exiting my position in this carrier yesterday. I'm now out of this one. I bought it at $20 back in January. I bought it after watching a video by Joe Brown over at Heresy Financial about the problems just starting in the supply chain. Joe, thank you very much for that video. Um, great channel, by the way. Highly recommend, recommend Heresy Financial. Um, but I got more than a triple out of this one. Uh, I added at 74 and change a few weeks ago. And then I noticed a technical breakdown. And I was able to get out finally just above that level. Uh, but I want to show you on this chart why technically I think this is done. Not just what we showed in the previous article about the rates finally slipping and that the, they're coming down somewhat. Let's get me out of the way here. But if you look at this chart, we have now dropped below the 50-day moving average. Let's zoom this in. Let's look at uh, three months, all right? We have fallen below the 50-day moving average. We came back up. We retested here, and we failed. We came back up. We retested here, and we failed. Two failures to retake the 50-day moving average. This one's going lower, folks. I, th I think the shipping problem has peaked. I may be early. Again, not a financial advisor. Um, but, you know, when you've made a triple on a stock, it's not like you're going to get hurt taking a profit. All right. I did really well on this one. Um, but in the event you, you bought this one based on what I told you, again, not a financial advisor. I'm not advocating you do that. I'm just letting you guys know I'm out of this one. I think it's heading back down. It's probably going to retest its 200-day line. Um, that's not to say that the carriers are not still in a good position. I think the problems on the high seas will continue. I just think they've peaked. And the fact that this thing went from $5 to almost 90 over the course of a year, uh, it's priced for absolute perfection. And that scenario no longer exists. Again, just my opinion, not a financial advisor. And again, the issues with the supply chain, we have way bigger issues than congested ports now. Now that the inflation has reached the energy market, now the supply chain problems are everywhere. They are everywhere. All right. Let's read a couple more of these before we call it a day. Was just wondering, have you looked into Nevada King? I kind of think it would be an interesting play like newfound gold to some extent. No, dumb money. I haven't looked at that one. I will take a look at that one, Nevada King. I'm guessing that is a minor. Um, but it's funny you should mention that. Do I still have that visual capitalist article? Because in this, I did notice somewhere down here, where was it? Nevada. Funny. The next page down. Um, no, I don't know what Nevada King is, but I'm guessing it's a silver miner. And it's funny you should mention that because bringing silver back to the silver state, Nevada is known as the silver state for its rich history. And silver mining today, it's the second largest silver producing state in the U.S. Talking about how there's several advantages of the political climate, the economic climate. 
So they're basically saying Nevada may be making a comeback in the silver mining sector. So I am definitely going to have to check that one out, DMM. Thank you, sir, for that one. That That's the second mention of Nevada in a few hours in the context of silver. So maybe there's a trend there. Thank you, sir, for that recommendation. That's a good one. Uh, let's see what else we have here. It's going to be used to insulate public spaces against wireless radiation once the FCC has lost enough lawsuits. What are we talking about? Is that copper? Hmm. Rusty Benhammer, I stack pewter too. Pewter's good to stack, I know. Rusty, uh, I guess we're both weird. Some guys play golf. Some guys drive fancy cars. Some guys have a mistress. I stack pewter. What can I say? I'm weird. Love your channel, DDM, DMM. Yep, love your channel too. Nevada King is a gold miner. Okay, it's a gold miner. I'm guessing they also produce silver because, again, going back to my visual capitalist article, again, 16% of silver comes out of gold mines. Um, I'll also mention that I don't think gold mines are going to be affected by the collapse in the base metals because gold and silver refiners i don't think i'm not sure about this i have to look into it but i don't think they are as energy intensive at least not in dollar value terms as like an iron ore or a nickel smelter right i think per unit energy input you get more dollar value in gold than you do in ore right you need to smelt a ton of ore to make two thousand dollars versus how much gold do you have to smelt one ounce to get two thousand dollars so I think the dedicated gold and silver miners and refiners, I think they're safe. But I don't quote me on that. I have not done enough research into that topic, and I don't know enough about it to really say that for sure. But I think, I think the primary miners, when it comes to silver and by extension gold, I think they're safe from the China Evergrande fallout and the collapse of the, of the Chinese housing market. Uh, but again, I was the first one to talk about this. Uh, if you can find an example of anybody talking about the collapse of the China housing market limiting the global silver supply, I would love to see it, and I'd love to give them credit for it. But for now, I'm taking it. That was mine. I thought of it first. I want a nickel every time somebody says it. Okay, that last part may be a stretch, but whatever. Anyways, guys, it is 427. We are going on past an hour now. Man, the time flies when we're doing this. I like, really like doing these live streams. I like uh, the chance to interact with you guys directly. Thank you for your comments and for your super chats, especially you guys for supporting the channel. Thank you very much. Remember, even though I'm not a financial advisor and this isn't financial advice, remember, no FOMO, okay? Don't be that guy. Don't be that me in 2006 buying at the market top, okay? Ask yourself before you click buy, are you FOMO? No FOMO. We don't do that here. Wait for your buy signal. Wait your turn. Be patient. Stuff goes on sale from time to time. All right. Anyways, guys, I want to thank you so much for your time, for your supporting the channel, for your comments, for watching these videos. Don't forget, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you're new here. Till next time, guys, live small and dream big.